maybe we could finish together? Maybe. I mean, we might have to add some, a little bit more money in the hat to get that show. To, oh boy, how much money do we need for that? We need at least a buck. Uh, well, no, a buck? I mean, come on, we need a $2 bill. I'll pay you. <laughs> anyway, getting back to this, getting back on course, I have something very special for you that I gave to all of the other uh, convention staff members, and this is for you in oh, honor. Oh, it's an oh. envelope. Oh, open it. I've always wanted an envelope. Yeah, it's even got it's even, your name. Even has your name, so you won't forget when you've had too much wine. Uh -oh. <laughs> uh, hmm. Please read what it says. <clears throat> well, I don't have my reading glasses on. <laughs> It's a picture of, um, apparently me holding this glass, saying, I'm not to lush, I'm a Hawano. Say it right. I'm not a lush, I'm a Hawano, as we all know you are. Thank you very much for coming and for everything that you do, Uncle Kage. Oh, wait, thank you, Werner, thank you. Yeah. I'm going to wear this. Yeah, that was seizure-inducing. <laughs> what time is it? Uh, the time is currently 5.54. You tell me what time it is. 5.54. Thank you! I got 5.54. Oh! Somebody left his hat. You should wear it. You should pour water. I'm going to wear it. <laughs> so, welcome to Uncle Kage's Story Hour. I think Alkali's head is much larger than mine. It's genetics, that's what happens. Of course, he's Jewish, you would, well, never mind. Um, I feel like a first person. Somebody tell me when I'm getting toward the front of the stage, okay? By the way, okay, old people, do you remember the television series by Sid and Marty Croft called Lidsville? No. Yeah, okay, you who said yes, you're lying. Sid and Marty Croft were LSD addicts in the 1960s. And they came up with what they called a bunch of children's shows. Oh, here's a great idea! A bunch of hats come to life and form a rock band! <laughs> it was... yeah. So, Leedsville, I grew up on Leedsville. It probably had an effect on me. Is anybody out there, by the way, I really can't see? We all left. And if somebody could guide me as to where my glass is. A little bit more. Uh, stay right. Do you want to hand? Stay right. Stay left. the empty one. <laughs> the wake up call. <laughs> Just throw it at him. <laughs> Turn around. <coughs> where's the, where's the... Okay, Very close. all right, so reach your hand back. A little bit. The table. A little, little, little more. Little more. Little right. Now, now. Right. now go to your right. This is my right. Go this is my left. Oh, just hang on the glass. What? Forward. Forward. Oh, 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 oh. oh. Oh, I found it! Aha! Now you can get drunk. We have another challenge on our hands here. Somebody's calling me. I'm staying. I am staying. Gently tip your head toward there. there, there. Oh, thank you, Pandera. As the Germans say, das is good as scheiße. <laughs> Is that good? Yes. yes. <laughs> Why don't you just pull up the hat? The 
that's probably a good idea. I believe in you, Kanye. Alkali. Come on, you can pull it just off. Just us, just keep the voices in your head. Now, we need to be louder and have a fetish for money. <laughs> oh, you got it. Very yeah. He did it! We're all mad at here. Yes! Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's actually kind of oh, oh, That's where it is. Same thing. Yeah, but one's almost slurry and one's a little bit. I can't find the microphone. It's in your pocket. What? Oh, thank you. Um, oh, hi. Can you do me a favor? And yes. What time is it? Uh, the time is five minutes. Fifty-eight. Yeah, 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 yeah. Put that on your head. Two minutes. Give or take. Okay. As I told them in, Ger in Germany, at your friends. We start on time where I am from. This is my official timekeeper up here. You tell me when it exactly hits the top of the hour. Because everybody, what are you doing? I, I'm topping your cup. That's two bottles? That's two bottles. I might need a case. <laughs> Wine that's water from the creek. Uh, what? That's creek water, you old fool. It does look like. Okay, dude, I'm from Philadelphia. I can drink anything. <laughs> you ever hear of the Schuylkill River? I have a life straw in my bag if you need it. I might need it, actually. What is this? Ever clear one? That's that, that, that is for me. Oh. You don't want but, dude, your hat went places. Shut up. It's home. <clears throat> oh, there you are. Wrong. Give me a 20 second warning, timekeeper. It is 6 o'clock. What? <laughs> it's 6 o'clock now. Now? Yes. Now. Oh, no. I'm starting. Go, go. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I am Uncle Kage. I don't. What the hell is this? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, this is a photoshopped image attempting to make fun of my colleague, Alkali, and I. Where you got these images from to Photoshop, I have no idea. I don't recognize those environs at all. I don't know. I'm leaving. Yes. Oh, as the Germans say, fucking the Alf. <laughs> or I shall be Alf Gepist. As a Jew, all I have to say is, please don't. Snap. <laughs> <laughs> Not gonna say it. Because, <laughs> like I say, I just got back from Germany. There are some things you really want to say, but you can't. <clears throat> like, all my friends over there, I, I'm old friends with a lot of the, the, the staff from Euroference, and they're all German. That's okay, though. But every once in a while, if I've had too much to drink, which is all the time, <laughs> I'll say to them, father used to do? <laughs> Cheetah, he's their chairman. He's got the greatest name in furry fandom. His name is Sven Take It Off. <laughs> yes, what's your name? Take It Off. <laughs> and it's German, so it's not a request. Yeah, take it off. And anything you say in German, it doesn't matter what you say. It sounds like you're furious of somebody. I just heard Means have a nice day. <laughs> I said to Sven, What did your grandfather used to do? And Sven told me, Well, my grandfather was drafted into the army at the age of 16 to fight the Russians who were coming in from the east. They put him in a truck. He rode out to the front. He stepped off the truck, took three steps and stepped on a Russian landmine and it blew off his leg and of course he was injured so badly they sent him home everybody else on the truck didn't come home so Sven owes his existence to a Russian landmine 
And then there's Dari. Dari is the security guy. If I say the word to you, Prussian and Aryan, that's Dari. The image in your head, he is like the quintessential. I am German, I am Dari, I am a German, I am Prussian, I am spy, I am spy, I am. <laughs> when I met him, he actually was in the German military. He is uh, what we call a Panzergrenadier. He was in the tank corps. Dari's job is if a tank gets bogged down in the mud, they send Dari out to pick it up and bring it back to the garage to get it. Dari is a big guy. He's, okay, Dari's shoulders are from here on. And he and I, we were actually on stage in England of all places. And I might have had a little bit to drink. And Dari was, I am Dari, I am Prussian, I am Ari, I am German, I am Spy, I am Spy. They said, hey, 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 Dari! <laughs> what did your grandfather do? And Dari looked at me and he said, my grandfather died in a concentration camp. I said, ah, I'm very sorry. And I took a sip of wine and Dari said, yes, he fell out of the guard tower. <laughs> The first three rows were wearing the wine after that. I was a perfect... <laughs> I like your reference. By the way, anybody who's coming in has no idea what's going on. You know, who is... I was going to say, who is the crazy old American? I'm, like I said, I'm just back from Europe. I'm Uncle Kage. I don't know why. I tell stories. Meaning I get up here and I make noises with my face and I drink the stuff out of this until I can't do it. Oh, I have some of this too. <laughs> until I can't do it anymore. Or until an hour has passed. My timekeeper's going to give me... I have an alarm set for 10 minutes till 7. Thank you. Thank you so much. Because like I said, my... You wanted 10 minutes till 7, right? Whatever I'm supposed to be done. Okay. Then, yeah. I don't know. Not my fault, not my con. <laughs> <sighs> not my con, not my problem. So, I got this, this list of stories up here to talk about, but I thought I'd throw a new one in, like what it took to get here. Yay. Notice the amused look on my face as I try to make this entertaining. Because the job of a, a raconteur, as the French would call me, is to take the foibles of life and try to find the humor in them and then communicate those stories to other people in a fashion that makes them laugh. This is going to be a significant challenge for me because it's only been 13 hours since all this shit went down. By the way, if I'm not allowed to say shit, I don't care. It's not my con. I can say whatever the hell I want, all right? <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I come from Raleigh, North Carolina. Yeah! Oh, thank you, one person. <laughs> it, I find it agreeable. Raleigh's a nice place to live. The state of North Carolina has... <laughs> I'm not going to get into that. That's for at the bar later, okay? But RDU, Raleigh, Durham... RDU, Raleigh, Durham... International Airport, I guess. That, that's where I fly out of. I arrived at RDU yesterday. See, I had a flight that was going to leave at 5, and it was going to connect through Chicago, and it was going to have an hour and a half in Chicago, and then I was going to get here last night, and I was going to go to the bar with Ronnie and Alkali and Pandas, and I was going to get nice and drunk and go to bed and wake up with a headache. That was the idea. I got to RDU, and the first thing I did was I went to get my shoes shined because I am a gentleman. And while I was getting my shoes shined, the fellas had a radio on. And I'm there, and what did I hear? They had a the National Weather Service in Raleigh has issued a severe thunderstorm warning for, and I was like, oh. I looked down, and oh yeah, that's us. And I started to think, okay. Maybe 
The storm will not affect my travel. And maybe Buffalo will fly out of my ass. We'll see which one is likely. You'd like to see that, wouldn't you? Yes! There's a drop down one for affinity for that. Just look. So, oh my god! Oh, I thought I was going blind. I was going to say my mother was right. Anyhow. TMI? What am I looking at? Oh yeah, that was me last year. I was young then. Anyway, sorry. Anyway. Xander's not here. I got to fill in for him. Uh, see, I am... Okay, you've heard of frequent flyers. I'm going to give you guys some some travel tips, okay? If you think you're going to be traveling a lot in a given year, like more than 25,000 miles, and that sounds like a lot, but it adds up. Always fly the same airline. Don't just say, well, this one's cheapest and that one's cheapest. Stick with the same airline. Because if you build up a lot of miles, they call you a frequent flyer. If you build up a certain number of miles, you're a silver level frequent flyer. You build up more miles, you're a gold level frequent flyer. Even more miles, you're a platinum level frequent flyer. Well, I fly a lot. I am an amazing, super colossal, silver, gold, platinum, suck my dick level frequent flyer. SMD for short. So they have a club for the SMD flyers. You don't recognize the door. It's this, this door that just says, you know, employees only or something. So I went into the SMD club and I was sitting there waiting here is another hint, even if you're not an SMD flyer, if anybody who's flying, listen to my words. You're going to be flying out at 5 o'clock. It's always going to say on time. It'll say on time even after the fall of mankind. The nuclear war has come. Civilization has crumbled. The apes are now riding around collecting Charlton Heston in nets. And it's still going to say your flight is on time. Go to the internet. Go to the app if they have it. And look for the inbound flight. Where is my flight coming from? That aircraft I'm going to get on, where is it now? Because if they say it's leaving at 5 o'clock on time, and it's coming from Fort Lauderdale six hours from now, it's not going to be on time. Learn that, all right? So I was watching the inbound flight very nervously. I was tracking it. Once that flight gets here to Raleigh, then I shall get on that flight and I shall fly to Chicago, I shall stay there an hour and a half, and then I shall fly to Indianapolis, etc., etc. Remember that part? At well, one point, I looked at my phone, and the flight, for some strange reason, was no longer in the air. It was now on the ground in Greensboro, North Carolina, which I thought very odd. Maybe, maybe the plane got tired. Maybe it had relatives in Greensboro. Why don't stop off and see mom? So I went to the SMD counter. And they said, would you like us to SMD? I said, no, I would just like some information on my flight. You got that. Thank you. <laughs> and by the way, I, I walk around a lot up here. Cameramen hate me. So, sorry, cameraman, but you know, you can SMD. Anyhow. <laughs> Hang on. Please drink before it. Yeah, that's actually no, that one's real. Anyway, I don't have that shirt anymore. It doesn't fit. Anyhow, I was watching the inbound flight. I went up to the SMD counter. I said, "Why is the plane in Greensboro?" And they said it got diverted. I said, "What for?" And they said, "Look outside." 
I looked outside and there wasn't an outside. All I saw was an apocalypse. There was lightning and hail and driving rain and then crashing clown noses from the sky. I don't know. I said, oh, okay. They said, we can't land in this. I said, I can understand that. It's okay. That flight will be here in half an hour. Oh, that's another lesson for you. Half an hour in airline lingo means we don't know. I'm serious. It's going to be here in half an hour. Then half an hour later, it's going to be here in half an hour. Then in half an hour later, it's going to be here in half an hour. That's the default. Half an hour is the default they give you. So we were getting kind of close to the point that if that aircraft isn't here in the next 10 minutes, I'm not going to be able to get to Chicago in time to make my connection to Indy. And I looked at the, 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 the weather map, because it was weather, right? I looked at the weather map, and it was amazing, because on the weather map, there was this little clear area around Greensboro, and this huge donut of orange and red surrounding it. And I thought, I don't think that aircraft is taking off. I pictured the aircraft sitting there going, <laughs> So I went to the SMD counter, I said, uh, guys, that aircraft is not taking off anytime soon. They said, oh, we expect it in half an hour. And I said, yeah, yeah, and I expect to be a virgin in half an hour. Okay, all right, great. <laughs> not gonna happen. Well. Anyway, I said, okay, can you change my connection to get me to Indianapolis later so I can make it? They went, tappity, tappity, tappity. And they said, sure, we got you on a later flight to Indy. Now, here's where I need to tell you that we have to give a shout out to the limousine company that Indy Furcon intended to send to pick me up at the airport. Because these people were cursing my name all night long. Because I was supposed to arrive at about 10 o'clock. Then I'm getting on a later flight from Chicago, see? Oh, call the limousine company, tell them I'm coming in an hour and a half later. So I sat and I waited. And I saw that that donut of red and orange was not moving. And the plane was still sitting there. <laughs> and once again, we're getting to the point that if it's not here right now, I'm not going to make it. So I went to the SMD counter again. I said, hi. And they said, would you like a story? No, 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 no. That's not, no, no, no. Later. Maybe. Okay, now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I say, okay, this is not going to work. Obviously, that aircraft is not going to get here in time to get me to Chicago. Can you reroute me? They went, tappity tappity, yes, we can send you back through Washington, D.C. And then you'll connect and you can, you can get to Indianapolis from there. I said, well, okay, what, what time will that arrive? They said, oh, about 10 o'clock. Okay, lovely. Do it. Book me. So I, I, I called up the, the folks here at India. I said, okay, remember how I said that tell the car company I'm going to be an hour and a half late? No, now I'm coming exactly on time. Tell them, forget that. They don't come late. Now they come on time. So I waited. And then I looked at the weather map for Washington, D.C. There's this little clear area around Washington, D.C. And this big orange and red donut around it. I said, I've seen this program before. So I went to the counter and I said, oh, okay guys, that airplane is not coming in from Washington in time to get me into Indianapolis, is it? And they said, remember, they're not allowed to say the truth, but I know the language. I said, okay. This is not going to work. Book me in the morning. So I sent word here, okay, 
Sorry, guys, I'm not coming in tonight. I'm going to come in in the morning. I'm going to fly out to Washington, D.C. early tomorrow morning, and I'll be here at about 10 o'clock a.m. So I, I got a little, little tiny hotel near the airport because reasons. Don't ask me to get into details. And I went to sleep in that nice little hotel with all the bed bugs. And uh, they're very good company. I'm lonely. I set my alarm and I woke up at 3.30 a.m. And I was getting myself showered and ready to go. And I happened to look at my, my phone. And I noticed that there was a message from United Airlines. I thought, oh, oh um, yes, you can. <laughs> Guys, could you do me a favor? It's a little distracting because I can't see it. Well, look. Yeah, but in order to do that, I got to go over here, and the more I have to drink, the more likely it is I'm going to fall off the stage. <laughs> That's more of a crack ball. That's totally fine. Just pull a He's got a point. <laughs> anyway. Uh, where was I? Oh, I was in the little hotel, wasn't I? Yes. We're about to take a shower. Thank you. And I saw there was a note from United Airlines, and I got nervous. I thought, well, maybe they're just calling to wish me a nice flight. <laughs> I looked in the note. They said, uh, your flight to Washington is FUBAR. We're going to book you on a 10 a.m. flight, and we'll get you to Indianapolis at 4.30 p.m. Remember that horrible red-orange ring around Washington? That aircraft never actually made it to Raleigh. It stayed there all night. So I called the airline. I said, no, 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 this will not work. I need to be in. I'm going to a convention with a bunch of furries and people who wear tails and ears and fur and things. And the lady said, do you feel all right, Mr. Conway? Is there somebody we can call? I said, no, honestly, I'm fine. I think. <laughs> How can I get to Indianapolis early? She said, well, you can fly. Stand by. All right. This is a crap shoot. You can fly. Stand by. And that means the flight is full. Everybody has a seat. And you're going to stand there and you're going to pray that some poor son of a bitch missed his connection or had a bad Taco Bell experience or died so you can have his seat. Incidentally, if you fly standby, don't check a bag. If you got a checked bag, you're screwed. So I said, okay, put me on the standby. It's going to go through Chicago. What time does it leave? She said, 5.30 a.m. It's now 4.30. Gotta go! Bye! I did a speed run to the airport. Got to the airport. Ran through security. and said, hi, I am on standby for your flight. Can I get to Chicago? And the lady went, tappity, 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 tappity. Probably. <laughs> Scientists love nice answers like that. Probably, maybe, correct to within an order of magnitude, which means wrong, by the way. <laughs> so I'm standing there thinking, oh, I hope that guy that went to Taco Bell just... Because mm, I... And I heard, stand by passion or Conway. Yes, 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 hello, hello. She gave me the seat. It's the last seat, all the way in the back, squished against the window next to the Russian guy that brought his own kielbasa. Okay, it's only an hour and a half to Chicago, right? So I got to Chicago. Now I am on standby to the flight to Indianapolis. Here's where the nail biter came in. This is all built up to this point, you see. Because looking at my app on the phone, I am number two on the standby list. There are two passengers who have not yet checked in. If it remains that way, then I'm okay. 
If one of those idiots checks into the last minute, I could have a problem. I was praying that somebody was having Taco Bell. So I went down to the gate and I'm pacing back and forth with my luggage. Oh, here's another hint. Here's another hint. This generally only works for gentlemen, all right? Get a hat. A nice hat, not a baseball cap. Get like a nice gentleman's hat, like a straw boater or, or, or a, a bowler or something. And look for a gate agent who's a lady my age or older. And wear your hat, and when you get up to the front, do this. Beg your pardon, ma'am. Oh, she'll give you anything you need. That's it. Trust me. Trust me. That's one of my tricks. Yo, she'll, she'll fly you first class on Emirates Airlines if you need. He took his hat off. So I'm standing there thinking, okay, two, and then all of a sudden one of them disappeared. One of those assholes checked in. Now, it's going to be me and the other guy. I'm looking around. Which one is he? Maybe I could take him. <laughs> and he'll walk up and I'll be like, Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I didn't mean for you to break your hip. I'll just take your seat while you're at the hospital. <laughs> this is how it works. They made the announcement that the flight from Chicago to Indianapolis was going to be delayed by half an hour. When we came to the boarding time that we normally would have boarded, a lady came running up, covered with sweat, out of breath, saying, have they boarded yet? And I said, no. She said, oh, I made it. I said, how nice. If the aircraft had left on time, I'd be in your seat and you'd be screwed. Why don't you come this way? So I'm pacing back and forth, waiting, and finally they started boarding the plane. Here's how it works. They have to get the whole plane boarded and make sure that that seat is free. You're a standby guy. I'm the last guy to board. I'm standing there, and the lady calls, you know, standby passenger Frank. That was the guy ahead of me. And I'm thinking, I could probably still take him. And here comes this guy with a hat that says, Desert Storm Veteran, looks like Dari. Well, I, I can't take him. <laughs> he can have, he, yeah, he, he can have both seats, he'll need him. Right? Wow. I said, give him my phone number here. <laughs> <laughs> and then, she got in and she said, Passenger Kumar, please come to the podium. Bless you. She said, last call for passenger Kumar. I thought, hmm, he was at Taco Bell. <laughs> Go Taco Bell, Taco Bell. Stand by passenger Kumar. Yes, yes, yes. And she's going taffy taffy. She said, well, I'm not sure if this person is here and I just missed them or if the seat's empty. I said, well, well, what are we? And at that point, I heard footsteps running. And I looked over my shoulder and way up the concourse, someone was running in our direction. And I thought, am I a gentleman? Or am I a dickhead? <laughs> If I just stay silent, I'm neither. So I'm just like, mm hmm. He's getting closer. She's going tapity. He's getting closer. Tapity tapity. He's getting closer. And she said, We're going to have to look on the aircraft to see if the, the, the seat is free. I said, Well, can we do it quickly? I really have to go to the bathroom. It'd be nice if we could do it quickly. She said, Okay, come with me. And we went through the door, and I saw this guy, and I just slammed the door behind me. <laughs> Sorry. 
<laughs> Sorry, buddy. And we went to the aircraft, and the lady is looking through. Yes, the seat is free. Good. Go put your ass in it. So I went and I put my ass in the seat. And yay! I got on the flight here to Indy, and I arrived at Indy. I probably should have called and told folks I was going to be on that flight. In retrospect, that would have been a good idea. Because they had the car service waiting for me on the flight from Washington, which was delayed by two hours. So they were waiting for me two hours from now. It's kind of interesting because at your reference last week, the theme was fractures in time. It was perfect. I won't go into the details of that. We finally met the nice lady from the car service, and she got me here exactly five minutes before my first panel. So, you'll forgive me if I seem a little bit off my game, but basically, I got here and have been going ever since, and this is my reward, so thank you very much. Uh, I've had dinner, thank you very much. Pretzels on the plane. <laughs> thank you very much, but I have a date. Her name is Helga, she's from Germany. If you remember the stories of Helga from Germany. But that is not what I'm going to talk about now. I'm going to talk about Canada, eh? Do we have any Canadians here in the audience? I'm sorry, buddy. We got some hosers here, eh? Since we're talking about airline horror stories, maybe I should talk about Canada. See, back in March, I went to Fernal Equinox. F-E to you and me. And Fernal Equinox was a lovely convention that takes place in Toronto, also known as New York North. And I was, uh, I was having a grand old time, and I was flying Air Canada A home. And because I have that SMD card with United, which is part of the Star Alliance, I got to stay in the Air Canada A lounge. And here I was sitting in the Air Canada lounge, Announcement. I've heard, I've been traveling for years, I've traveled the world, I've heard all sorts of announcements, I never heard this one before. You know, bing! Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we seem to be experiencing a fire in the gate area. We would like to ask our passengers kindly not to go to the gate area. I thought, well, that's a very, very good piece of advice. There were fellows sitting next to me and said, that's actually a good thing. Since there's a fire in the gate area, let's not go to the gate area. Canadians are very practical people. I'll give them that. So we sat and we chatted amicably. And after about three, four minutes, I got to thinking, oh, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. If there's a fire in the gate area, that's where my plane is. Maybe this might affect my flight home. I'm going to go to the front desk and I'm going to check with them and say, is this going to affect my flight home? When I walked around the corner to the lobby, the entire staff of the club was standing there. The manager was saying, okay, we need you to sweep the back. You're going to get the people down the stairs here. We're going to get everyone here. I said, okay, I think I've seen enough. And I went back to the fellows I was sitting with. I said, guys, get your bags. I think we're leaving. And that's when the announcement came on. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we feel it prudent at this time to evacuate the club. If you would kindly gather your belongings and come to the front uh, counter, we will lead you to safety. And we kind of looked at each other. We said, we have to leave. And all of us looked back at the bar <laughs> where nobody was. And we thought, well, if there's a fire... It would be bad if all of that was here. We'd be doing a service, you know, if we... But at that point, somebody noticed we can smell smoke. 
let's just go. So he went to the lobby of the Ear Kennedy A Lounge. And by now, there was a pall of smoke. And we're starting to think, okay, this, this actually might be a, an interesting situation. We could smell it and we could see the smoke. I have the highest praise for the Air Canada staff. They kept everybody calm, kept everybody orderly. They opened the emergency door and they let us down these concrete stairs and around a corner and through this and around and, 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 and through the rat maze outside. And when we got outside, we walked for about 100 feet into a set of glass doors, and just inside those glass doors was a Tim Hortons coffee shop. All is right with the world, that's all I need. Because if you've ever been to Canada, Tim Hortons is the national beverage. Whereas the United States has, oh, you know, baseball, apple pie, Chevrolet and everything. Canada has Tim Hortons. It's an amazing coffee, which they add heroin to, <laughs> to make you addicted. And oh, I'm addicted. So, we got in there and they had us all in this little area, and I sent a text to my dear and sainted mother so she would not worry. Hi, airport is on fire, have Tim Hortons, love you. <laughs> she was mad at me for some reason. I told her, but that comes later. So they sent along a bus, and a bunch of us got on the bus, but it wasn't enough to hold everybody. And the bus took us, I think, to Ottawa, because it, it was going on and all the way to the other side of the airport. And it dropped us off, and we all got off the bus, and the bus drove away. And there were no Air Canada representatives. And we went in through another set of glass doors and we found ourselves at a customs receiving area, an arrival area for Canada. And we kind of stood there, what do we do now? Well, there was an airport Mountie there who was into law, order, and move along there, who kept telling us, just go, 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 you have to go back through customs, back through customs, go through customs, go, you have to go. I said, well, excuse me, um, we come from Terminal 1. He said, yes, yes, we have to go through customs. I said, oh, so we go back through customs, even though we just, okay, uh, maybe you don't understand. We were evacuated from Terminal 1 because of the fire. And he said, what fire? I said, I'm not going to get a lot of information from you, am I? I just, I just had that feeling. Um, Terminal 1 happens to be ablaze right now. If you look outside, do you see all the red lights and the orange glow on the right? That's Terminal 1. That's where we come from. See? It kind of looks like the Amazon. See that? Too soon. Sorry. Sorry, buddy. Sorry, buddy. That's what the Canadians say. Sorry, buddy. So he said, I don't know, okay, I have no information, just go back across the border, across the border, <laughs> back into Canada. So I went to the, the, the thing where you talk to people with the, the passport and everything, and, what now? And the, uh, the, the lady said, how long do you plan to be in Canada? I said, well, about two minutes if I have my way. Yeah, I have a good sense of humor. By the way, just, just a little point of contact. And I said, well, the thing is, we were sent here from Terminal 1. It's on fire. She said, really? I said, yeah. She said, well, welcome to Canada. <laughs> so we all went in and we found ourselves in a baggage claim area. Now what? Do we, do we claim our bags? Do we stay here? I tried to get a, you know, send a tweet to Air Canada, who, by the way, just won the award for best customer service eight year in a row. Hi, Air Canada, Air Terminal 1 is on fire. We've been evacuated, what do we do? Nothing. 
So all these people are clustered around, lost, confused, scared. What do we do? They had a little information desk. Not a desk, it was a chair with a little tiny podium in front with an eye on it. It was either information or he was selling iPhones, I don't know. But I went up and I said, uh, excuse me, pot on what? You have to say it in both languages in, in Canada, you know how it is? It's both French and English, but it's not actually French, it's Quebecois, but that's another story. <clears throat> um, we just got evacuated. <clears throat> Do you know what's going on in Terminal 1? He said, no, what's going on in Terminal 1? I said, let me tell you a story. <laughs> I told him the story, he said, oh, and he got on his phone. <coughs> he tried to find me some information or sell me an iPhone, I don't know. He hung up, he said, okay, here's what I suggest you do. Go down here to the end of the terminal, You'll see a set of double doors, turn right. Go through the double doors. There's another set of double doors, turn left. Go down the concourse, go four exits down. You'll see a set of escalators. Take the escalators up to the tram and ride the tram to Terminal 1. That's on fire. <laughs> I said, uh, excuse me. What if Terminal 1 happens to still be on fire when I get there? He said, well, then come back. <laughs> By the way, I don't make shit up. I'm telling you exactly how it happened. So, I was, uh, there was another fellow with me. His name was Bruce. He was on his way to New York. and We, we became friends in adversity. So we went down and we did the double doors and we're walking along. There's supposed to be a set of escalators going up to the people mover. And as we were walking... I glanced over my shoulder, and there was this giant mob of people following us about 50 feet behind. Oh. And I thought, this is very strange. Then I realized I was wearing my bowler at the time, which was serving as this kind of beacon. <laughs> this guy's walking purposefully. He must know where he's going. I thought, this guy could lead it to Tim Hortons. This would be wonderful. <laughs> we got up to the people who were the little tram thing. And when we got in and sat down, that was the first time I realized I can still smell smoke. It's me. Apparently, we were covered with smoke. We hadn't realized it. That's how close we were to this shit. Well, the, the tram pulled into Terminal 1, which I'm very happy to say was not actively on fire at the time. Much to my relief. So we got off the tram, and here we were in Terminal 1. Along with the, I can only estimate to be 2,000 people who had left Terminal 1 who now wanted to go back. <coughs> what time have we? Uh, the time is 6.41. I'm going to truncate the story just a bit. I'll leave out the part about the moose and the Tim Hortons. We're going to skip to the good part. I'll tell you about the moose another time. Because I'm running low on time. Don't to give more time. Oh, you'll have to talk to... Anyway... A long, long, long delay later, it became clear that my aircraft was not going to be leaving that night because the border was closed. It never reopened after the fire. Nobody told us anything. All of the border agents left and went home. And these 2,000 passengers were standing there hoping to cross the border of the United States. There's an allegory here. We're not going to touch it. So I went to the Air Canada ticket agent, of which there were two open, and I was on the phone to United, who I had my ticket through. Can you help me? And the bottom line was, no. Air Canada owns your ass. We can't help. 
So I got to the lady and I said, okay, I was talking to the United lady. The United lady said that she could put me on a flight in the morning at 8.45 to get back to Raleigh. And she went, tappy, 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 don't see it. Well, uh, she's, no, she, she said that there's an 8.45 flight from Toronto to Raleigh. Don't see it. I said, uh... Parlez-vous anglais? 8.40... It's, it's 8.45 flight to Raleigh. <laughs> tap, tap. I'm sorry, I don't see it. I said, oh, oh wait, 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 wait. Yeah, yeah. Oh, fuck that. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay, flight, flight 3543. She went, oh, there it is. Oh, oh, you must not have been able to see it among the 445 other flights from Toronto to Raleigh tomorrow, could you, you bitch? <laughs> Don't take that personally. Sorry, buddy. So she said, here's your boarding pass, but it's going tomorrow. I said, lovely. Can I have my bag? She said, no. But, but they're my bags. I like my bags. I'd like to have them back. She said, sorry, buddy. She said, they haven't been cleared by customs. You're going to have to come back in the morning. So I called up Ronnie. I said, you got floor space? He said, yeah. I said, I'm on my way. So I crashed to Ronnie's place. And then I got back to the airport three and a half hours in advance. I went to the agent and I said, okay, <clears throat> here is my boarding pass. I want to make sure my bags are on the flight. The lady went tappy, tappy, tappy. Have you ever seen this? Have you ever seen this? When the agent is going tappy, tappy and her face starts to get like this. Like crinkling up smaller and smaller <laughs> until it's a little dot. <laughs> And I said, uh, okay, I'll buy, what's wrong? She said, well, this is, I've never seen this before. You have a ticket and you have a seat assignment, but you don't have a reservation. What did that mean? That's what I said. How could that be? She said, I don't know. That shouldn't happen. I said, well, miss, I shouldn't be here. Can we resolve this? So she went toddling off. She came back 20 minutes later. I got it. It took some doing. Here is your ticket. Here's your boarding pass. Your bags are loaded on the flight. Hallelujah. I'm on my way home. I got to the border. Hi, border guy. Don't joke with the border guys, by the way. They don't like that. They got no sense of humor. He said, can I see your bag tag? Here it is, border guy, here's my bag tag. He went tap, tap. He said, oh, your bag hasn't been cleared through customs. I said, but, but it's been all night long. He said, I'm sorry, buddy. That's what the Canadians say. I said, what do I do? He said, okay, go down here at the end of the concourse and make a right. There's a set of double doors. Go through those double doors, make a left. You're gonna go down four, you're gonna see. I said, I think I've been there before. But when I got to the end of that particular instruction, there was a little Air, Air Canada A service area with a long line of people. And there were eight Air Canada ticket agents at computers. And I got in the line and I saw these eight agents and I saw the goddamnedest thing because guy number seven never moved. He didn't move, he didn't blink. He was standing there. I said to the lady next to me, 
I think he's dead. <laughs> Finally, I got past the corpse and got up to the lady at the front. And I said, my bag hasn't been released. She said, oh, you don't have to wait in the line. Oh. I said, I really wish you hadn't said that. I'm American. We got the Second Amendment. I didn't say that. Don't say that. They don't like that. Don't say that up there. If you do say that, just say, sorry, buddy, and that'll get you out of it. She said, go sit over there. There's a big board, and, and names flash up. Watch for your name. And when you see your name flash up, that means that your bag has been released, and you can go back through, through security. So I sat down, and I was watching the board. And watching, and watching, and time is marching on. And it's getting closer. And something I noticed was the name would flash up, and it'd be there for 10, 20 minutes, and then it would disappear. There were only like five or six names, but it kept cycling through, and I started thinking, what if my name came up and I missed it? So I was thinking maybe I should go check, and then I saw something. Back near the counter, there was a very, very frail old, please pardon the expression, a, a frail old black lady in a wheelchair. And as I watched, she, she got out of the wheelchair and very painfully started making her way to the gentleman's room. Okay, I'm from North Carolina. All right, I'm, just, I'm not going to get involved in this. But I watched after a moment. She came out of the gentleman's room. I thought, oh, all right, all right, all right, all right. And I went up and I said, excuse me, ma'am, can I, can I help you? She didn't speak any English. She only spoke French. She was from the islands. Fortunately, I speak French. And she said to me, it was the most adorable thing. Je dois faire du pipi. I said, oh, uh, ici, madame, uh, it's, voila. And I, I led her over to the ladies' room. Thought that'd be appropriate. And while she was in there, I went and I got her wheelchair. And I brought her wheelchair over. And I waited for her. And when she came out, I helped her into the wheelchair, and then she took my sleeve, and in French, that lovely, lovely accented island French, which is so beautiful, she explained to me she didn't have a boarding pass, and she didn't know what to do. And I realized she'd been sitting there since I got there. So I decided to be the ugly American. All these Canadians up there, I up said, Excuse me, is anybody looking after this lady? She needs help. And one of the ticket agents came out. The one singular ticket agent in the entire Dominion of Canada who doesn't speak French. <laughs> so I translated for her. This lady had been sitting there more than an hour, had been forgotten. The ticket agent very quickly got her her boarding pass and got somebody to wheel her out to her flight. Why did I do that? Because my father was Sam Conway. That's why I did that. Anyhow, pardon me. There we go. Away the anger. Yes, I need it. I sat back down. I looked at the names. I thought, oh, my name really could have gone by now. So I went and I said, excuse me, how do I know my name hasn't gone by? And the lady came out and said, let me see your bag tag. She went, boop, oh no, your bag's released. Oh, Gotta go! Back down around the corner, through the double doors, and around the corner, be right back <laughs> Same guy at the border, hi, it's me, here. And he went, Your bag's released? I said, yes, sir, they said it was released. He said, it says here it's been deleted. Oh. I, said, I said, 
What do I do? He said, okay, go down to the end. I said, I know, I've been there before. I got back. I was not in the mood to be nice. Excuse me, buddy. What the hell just deleted me? And the lady took it and she said, I don't know. And she started going to all the other people at the terminals, including the corpse. And I could, I can read lips. She was saying, <laughs> Finally, she called a supervisor. This nice little Indian gentleman came out. Hello, how can I help you, please? It says my bag is deleted. Oh, I can help you with that. Thank you very much. He came over to the ticket lady. Oh, hit F2. Now hit F4. Okay, do you see where it says deleted? Now click undelete. <laughs> really? Ding. There it is. Okay, your bag should be fine. I'm terribly sorry, buddy. Yeah, whatever. Okay. Went charging back to the border. Blammo! Made the flight just as they were reaching for the handle to close the door. Got myself home. Wrote a scathing, vitriolic, poisonous letter to Air Canada. I called them everything but Irish in that letter. I called them Irish too. Told them that this was the most abysmal customer service. They left me. There was a goddamn fire. Here I am in a foreign country surrounded by cannibals who speak French. And, and yes, I was angry. And it took them four weeks to send me an answer back. It'll take us eight more weeks to send you an answer. Eight weeks later, here comes the answer from Air Canada. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> I wish, I wish to God that I was making up even a portion of that story. Okay, the cannibals, I made that part up. What time have we? Uh, it's 6.55. You have five minutes. I have five minutes! Chug the wine from bail? <laughs> There's a lot of long stories here. Five minutes. Okay. I can teach you something about running a convention in five minutes. Oh, no. Don't do it. I can't. I was sitting out talking to a bunch of young fellas out there said, we're going to start a convention. <laughs> it was so adorable because Alkali and I were both there. They're like, we're going to start a convention. Then we started talking to them. And it was so cute because after about 50 minutes, they're sitting there like this. That's what it's like. <clears throat> People want to file non-profit status for their conventions. In the United States tax code, there's two ways you can do it. There's 501c3, which is pure public charity. You better be able to pass yourself off either as a church or a school and good luck with that shit. Or five or museum, thank you, lawyer. <laughs> or 501c7, which is a social organization. Let me tell you the requirements for 501c7. These are the requirements. <clears throat> the club club must be organized for exempt purposes. Okay, got that. The club must be supported by membership fees, dues, and assessments. You guys paid a membership fee to get here, right? <clears throat> yep. The club must provide an opportunity for personal contact among members. Uh, we're here. Well, uh, <laughs> Have we done that? Yeah. So. You're welcome. <laughs> and if we haven't, sorry, buddy. <laughs> I think you guys have had enough listening to a 
Stop you old drunk up here. No. no. Oh, you haven't finished the wine yet. What? You haven't finished the wine yet. Finish the wine. Oh, yeah. Dude, there's like an entire bottle in there. Yeah. That's a yeah. That does not matter. Yeah. Don't be a pussy, Kage. <laughs> really? Will continue. I've designed that organization that I could fall in a hole tomorrow and my staff, excellent as they are, will be able to continue on without me. However, if I chug this and I die, then you won't hear the rest of the stories on this list. But there's always more stories that happen during the year. But not if I'm dead. Of course, that would be an incredible story, wouldn't it? So there's the time I died. In fact, maybe I did die in that fire in Terminal 1 of Pearson Airport. And what I am living through right now is my penance for my sins. If that's the case, God bless my sins. One minute! 6.59. Get your ass up here! I don't see it. Yo! He's at the bar. What? He's busy getting ready to do Who's Business spilling oatmeal. Yeah, that's He's it. busy getting ready to do Who's Line, which he's supposed to be doing. Oh, for God's sake. He's going. He's going. 30 seconds. All right, all right. Hang on. Hang on. Hey, oh, I dropped a penny. Oh, How much for charity to chug that wine? Uh, How much for charity? For charity. Put another on it. <laughs> yeah, like All right, I'll tell you what. I'm going to keep going until Alkali kicks me off the stage. Woo! Or I can just fill in for him. I don't have the hat, but I can do it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Charity Who's Live! Man, you video that's not a jibe. All of you go to his YouTube channel and like and subscribe.